are pretty on Ulysses. There it is. Hello, BookTube. I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my Friday Reads. I thought this was going to be an outdoors one. Um, it's calling for rain all day, heavy rain, blah, blah, blah. But when I peeked out the window, actually went out and stood on my balcony for a minute, put my hand out, it wasn't raining and it looked like I'd probably be able to sneak out and get back before it rained. And by the time I finished my cup of coffee, luxuriantly, you're out dressed, packed up. Oh my God, I'd love filming outdoors. So I'm not complaining about this part of it. But I was thinking as I was packing everything up and forgetting something and putting it in and doing this and that, but it's just like packing to go away for the weekend. <laughs> so got got downstairs, opened the door, and it had started to spit rain, and I decided, you know what, I'm not going to chat. I, even though I could go somewhere where I'd have that that gazebo thing over my head, I'm not, I'm not going to chance it, so here I am. I wanted to be outside. Anyway, other than that, I'm in a good mood, <laughs> so I hope you guys are doing great. And... I don't have any chatty news. Let me talk about disappearing comments. Uh, it's been an off, on again, off again problem, both when I comment on other channels' videos and when commenters comment on mine. And it's just seemed to be really terrible in the last week. So, unfortunately, you can't leave a URL link in a comment because YouTube, the YouTube algorithm automatically marks it as spam. It doesn't go into a hold folder where I can review it and approve it. It should. There is one of those folders. But these things are just disappearing. So I'm it's showing up in my notification. I'm getting the email from YouTube to say the comments there. But it's not on the channel and I can't answer it. So uh, don't... Uh, it's ridiculous, but you can't leave a web link in the um, in your comments now I can leave a web link if I reply to your comment on my channel but if I'm commenting on another channel's video I can't leave a web link it'll it'll uh, disappear and uh, then there's other ones like a comment of Brita's th that was no web link no no she was for a change she wasn't being really foul-mouthed and swearing and stuff it wasn't that it just disappeared and then I won't give the last name but a, a commenter who I don't recognize his name Paul, uh, the last name begins with the letter S, left a really interesting comment on my Friday Weeds last week about the woman in white and the way of all flesh, and it just disappeared now. He uses the word gay in the comment. Like, we need to file a human rights class action suit against YouTube. The word queer will get an automatic delete? Does the word gay? Ugh. So... If your comment disappears, that's why. YouTube is just acting up. Uh, so, anybody got any solutions to this? It's pain. And here is my little one minute week in review of other videos that have gone up since you last saw me on Friday. But in his day, he was the cat's meow. You know, I don't think I've made that clear enough. Not only was he best selling in Canada, he was best selling around the world in America. People were clamoring to read his books. Ralph Connor is a pseudonym for Charles William Gordon, and he was a Presbyterian minister and missionary. Are you still with me? The book is so uncomfortable that I had to really take it in stages uh, because it's it's so it's so meaty and it's so it's so difficult. It's so kind of squirmy as a book, and I think that's what's what's really clever about it. Squirmy is a squirmy. lovely. <laughs> that's the official term. <laughs> It's fantastic. So uh, what I would add, just to, to put another word in that is not quite nearly as lovely as yours, is that the narrative and the narrative strategy, I think, is to implicate the white reader. I thought, well, I haven't read anything like this before. Um, it was getting some buzz and it was just kind of different from what uh, I was usually reading. So I thought, well, this sounds weird and interesting and I'm going to give this a try. So I liked it. I didn't love it but I'm glad I read it. There were some things I could relate to and some things that kind of went off the rails for me, so. All right, so yeah, lots to say. Well, a fair amount to say today. Hopefully this one will be a little shorter. How do you like my, my Queen Elizabeth coffee cup? I have two bales to tell you about and I finished one, started a bunch. Let's start with the bales. 
This uh, short story collection from Holland, uh, The Dandy by Nina Polak, translated from the Dutch by Emma Rao, um, didn't work. It was about as successful as its cover image. Um, I just thought the writing was terrible. I read two stories, and I'll never get those 16 minutes back. The stories were very short, but it was just the most blasé prose, so nope. A longer story on this one because I actually read this off and on like I you know I'm reading too many books so I did not pick it up that often but I eventually I did decided to bail on it this week and that's this lesbian novel with the fabulous cover infraction by Yvonne Zipter but I just got I think I got halfway through it almost and you know people might have opinions I might have an opinion that sometimes books don't work for me because I don't pick them up often enough to keep a sense of momentum I really don't think that's what was going on here I think that this novel just got bogged down in info dumpy historical research what I loved about it was so it's set in 1875 in Russia the author's American and so everything as far as I'm aware that she got she got by research and it's based on a true life story and these two women fall in love in 1875 in St. Petersburg and the love scenes and the extremely tense and um, ang anxiety ridden explorations of sexuality between these two main characters was so lovely I loved reading about it she just Yvonne Zipter had the perfect touch for writing that I would read a non-historical novel by her that about lesbians about lesbians or anybody who's having sex because she writes the sex scenes and they're not sex I mean it's not graphic but it's you know it's it's just well crafted scenes about physical affection and all the emotional you know when you're really closeted and can just like I can imagine how uh, on edge I was when I first started exploring my sexuality so just transport that back 150 years or whatever really well done but the rest of the story just felt very intellectual an overabundance of detail and and it just didn't engage me people that are like more intellectual like historical fiction that has a lot of detail like I just didn't think it all kind of grounded the story in anything that I could viscerally hang on to except for those few scenes where the the ladies were pawing at each other in the most adorable and uh, uh, heart-rending way. And I have finished one. I, I planned to finish two, but I decided to bail on that one. So that was the other one I was planning to finish. So, you know, it's the same as finishing it, <laughs> bailing on it. So I only finished this one. De Niro's Game by Rawi Haj. And I quite enjoyed this. I give it four stars. I didn't love it, or I didn't... There was things that I took a star off for, but I really enjoyed it. I recommend it quite highly. Rawi Haj is a Lebanese-Canadian novelist, and this is set in uh, Beirut. Most most of the story is set in Beirut um, during the Civil War. And these two childhood friends that are now, like, 17 or 20 years old, they're very young, and they are uh, being typical young men, but in war-torn... Lebanon and get all mixed up with all of the stuff going on with the Civil War and there are deaths in their immediate family because of the bombing and they get up to no good and they get involved with criminal stuff but they're basically I, th I think you could say without being too simplistic they're both decent young men but caught up in a very terrible s social political situation and parents have been killed and they're kind of left to fend for themselves it's quite heartrending it's really well written although I find that he he has a bit of a verbal flourish where he gets a little bit carried away not not consistently but I could probably point to five or ten scenes in this 300 page novel where he just got a little bit carried away with an image that just kind of spun out of control and I he lost me but for the most part it's very vivid writing it was emotionally engaging but then the first person narrator um, he well I don't want to say anything that might be even the slightest bit spoiler so let's just say there is a change of location and the story continued for about the last third or something in this other place in this other country and I, I wasn't nearly as engaged and I thought the plot got a little bit woo-woo so to wrap up the story maybe arguably 
got to be quite a bit like a spy novel, which I hate. I'm so disinterested in anything to do with spies. But a lot of those things wouldn't bother other readers, and they only bothered me enough to knock a star off. I, I think it's a really good novel, and I will try more by this guy. Madeline Tien's life partner. So I've started what? One, two, three, four. I started five, but that one was the bail, the short story. So um, I've got four books newly in progress to tell you about. The first one is the audiobook of The Way of All Flesh by Samuel Butler. And I'm enjoying it. It's a very slow, um, just setting up background. I've, I've listened to, I think, 6% on audio. And the audio, I'll put the name of the, of the audio narrator in the show notes, and I'll put it on the bottom of the screen because it's fabulous. The commenter that I just mentioned, Paul's comment was that he loved this book, be, not so much for the story, but for the wit and wisdom of the obviously gay narrative voice, which I hadn't heard anything about Samuel Butler, but he was a confirmed bachelor who had very intense male friendships and, you know, never, probably never did. Uh, there's no evidence that it went beyond that and, you know, none of my business, probably. But, um, once I got that comment, I started to do some more research, but certainly the audio narrator, if he's not gay, he certainly convincingly plays a gay voice, and there's just a campy gay tonality to the way he's reading the book. I'm, I'm enjoying it. It's too early to say much, just it's setting up the story. It's several generations of this family based on the author's family. I think it's really well done. I, got, I had a half a page long sentence for my Sunday sentences last week that I... Um, got in from the first chapter so starting out good too early to say much more than that of all the ones i've started this week all of which i'm you know enjoying to to varying degrees there's none that i'm not enjoying but this is the one that's really grabbed me and uh, i'm so kind of surprised by how much i like it a touch of jen by beth morgan this is a scream and it's i think it's more than just satire or comedy it's kind of a snarky comedy I've read 20% because I can't put it down, which, you know, for me, reading 20% of a book in one week means that it's on put downable because I'm, you know, reading 27 books or something. I see on, I'm not the first to uh, talk about it on BookTube. I want it to be, but I'm not too old to be the first when it's millennial fiction. I love millennial fiction. God, we should just, the rest of you, stop writing. The millennials, take over. Um, It's a young couple. They're both waiters, and they are just losers. But there's, it's not so unkind that it's turning me off. <laughs> and I can't... The t I don't know what more to say about the tone until I finish the book. And they are obsessed with following their... F the guy's ex-co-worker from another restaurant job that I think it was six months ago or maybe a year ago that that restaurant closed. And so he follows her on Facebook. But he hasn't really seen her since the... And that's, that's hot Jen. <laughs> and, and the two of them are obsessed with checking her Facebook posts and fantasizing and role-playing sexual things. It's not a super, it's not superficially told, so it's really engaging. I, th these characters are so laughable. It's such smart humor. Beth Morgan is from Texas. Originally from Texas. I think she's in Brooklyn now. I just am beguiled by it. I, I hope it doesn't get... If the tone locks onto kind of an, a mocking kind of thing about the characters that I'm not into that kind of satire but so far it's there's others other energies kind of flowing through the story but it's really funny and I just <laughs> they are so dweeby this couple they they have no social skills so where I'm at right now it's not a spoiler I don't think it because I'm not going to talk about anything in detail but they bump into Jen at the Apple store and then she invites them she'd never she can barely remember her ex-co-worker, the guy, and she's never met his girlfriend. They live together, the boyfriend and girlfriend. Um, and she invites them on a, I forget, surfing trip or something. And so they go, and they just, they're so obtuse that nobody really likes them, but they're too stupid, really, to realize how little they are impressing anybody. The humor is cringeworthy. It's like, oh, I hope I've never done that. I had kind of a good feeling about it. And so far, it's borne out. I'll Go On by Huang Zhong-un, translated from the Korean by Emily Ye Wan. This is good. It, it's, it's a little bit slow go, uh, going to get into it, but I have read 50 pages. It's quite an easy read. There are three main characters. Uh, so far, the story's been focalized through the older sister, Sora. And her younger sister, she thinks, so far, it's only that she thinks her younger 
unmarried sister is pregnant. And then the other character is a man that they grew up with, living in the same, maybe boarding house, but sharing a house that was bit divided into suites, and he was the next door kid. So they grow up, they grew up together, the three of them are all very close. And the two sisters' mother, her husband, was killed in a work accident, and she never really kind of recovered her ability to kind of deal with life. And so that's so far all that's been set up, but the writing is quite, it kind of flows like water. I wasn't sure what I thought of the style at first, but I'm, I think it's really working for me and lots of images and stuff. Some of the images go on, like I just read three pages about a sickly moth on the wall in their childhood home and that went on a little bit too long for me, but for the most part, I'm quite charmed by it. And the last one that I've started, and it's also starting out really good, is The Fortune Men by Nadifa Mohammed. This is on the Booker Long List. This is set in Cardiff, Wales, 1950, and it's about a whole cast of characters of all different races, working class people that lived and worked in Tiger Bay, uh, and that was where sort of kind of the immigrant lower working class people lived. I don't know if that's still there, but it's historically it was a really vibrant part of Cardiff where all kinds of multicultural energies, and this is a very, very multicultural story. The writing is good. It took, it's taking me some time to get used to it, but it's really vivid. She's very descriptive. I don't know much more than that yet. Just getting introduced to the characters. Mohammed is a Somali British writer. She was born in Somaliland. A lot of the characters are Somali uh, immigrants to Wales. I'm impressed so far. So that's what I've started. So I wasn't supposed to start that short story collection from Holland because I hadn't made room for it on my current reads, but it's gone. I bailed on another one, so that frees up one space, and I finished the Leban Lebanese novel, um, so that gives me space for two, and I'm going to start three, so I'm still being a little loosey-goosey with my, my rules, but <laughs> it's my life. The next short story buddy read that Joe Smith and I will do starts, we check in on the first story in this collection next Wednesday, Multitudes by the Irish writer Lucy Caldwell. And I don't remember the story well, but it was because of her story, Lucy Caldwell's story, in this anthology of short stories by Irish women, or something gays. Here's the gif. I recommend it very highly. You can do it on audio. That's what I did. It's a fantastic anthology. And her story really impressed me. Caldwell, born in 1981, so she's young. Born in Belfast, 1981. I think I said when I bailed on the Ethiopian novel, I wasn't going to try to fill that spot, but uh, I been thinking I think I'm gonna to try to fill all the spots I don't know about North Korea I still haven't heard of anything that I'm really that interested in reading for North Korea so I might let that one go but I have one some of the ones where there isn't a lot in translation from the country I know that the, the suggested guidelines for invisible cities is that to read in translation not not the transplanted writers that write in English that moved to America or whatever, but I'm, I'm ignoring that because I often have better luck with those. So I've been hearing about this book and most of the people that I've heard review it didn't like it that much, but the things they didn't like about it, and I can't remember any details now, but the things they didn't like, I thought, oh, that, that might not bother me. The Parking Lot Attendant by, I haven't found any help online with this woman's name, Nafkot Tamarat. Anybody can help me to correct that? And she is an Ethiopian-American writer, native of Boston. And this is a, 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 an immigrant story about an Ethiopian-American man. It's set in Boston. And the father, I think, is the immigrant. And he is a parking lot attendant, but he is also, the, the synopsis says, the unofficial king of Boston's Ethiopian community. Now, that sounds interesting. I hope I like it. Uh, it's been kind of in the back of my mind since I first heard about it. Like I say, there's been very lukewarm reviews. Not not all of them, but I keep thinking, I want to give that a try. So I'm going to give it a try. I'm not going to start anything for the booker list. I've got enough of those in progress. So I'm going to start one uh, just because read. And this is the one that was featured in the first episode of Bite Size Book Chats. Alex uh, recommended it. I had already bought my copy and it has arrived and I'm going to start it. Razorblade Tears, a thriller by S.A. Cosby. And this is about 
two fathers, a, a black father and a white father, both uh, kind of hard, toxically masculine men that were estranged from their gay sons. Their gay sons were lovers and they were murdered. And the fathers unite to try and solve the murder. So this is um, apparently very literary. The premise of it really appeals to me. I don't usually do thrillers. You know how I feel about mysteries. I, I have to try it. So I'm gonna try it. Am I repeating myself? And this is quite a new release, just published a few weeks ago. Uh, my first vaccination is next Thursday, so as long as I don't have serious side effects, I'll see you all next Friday. Thanks for watching.